And our first speaker of the session is Professor Matei Sosalie. Um, he is an associate professor, associate professor at Columbia University. And uh, so he has uh, won numerous awards um, for his work in grasping and manipulation, including uh, an SF Career Award, Sloan Fellowship, ONR YIP, and so on. So uh, without further ado, Matei, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Wen Long. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Let me just uh, share my screen. So uh, we're switching gears. Uh, we are moving to hands. Uh, as as uh, Wen Long said, we're, uh, we usually do grasping, manipulation, and in terms of rehabilitation robotics, we're focusing on a hand orthosis. Uh, and um, I'm here with Ava and Jingqi from our lab, and they'll help me give the, you know, they'll, they'll give the meat, the technical meat of this presentation. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge our amazing collaborators up at the rehabilitation medicine department, up at the medical school, uh, without whom none of this work would be even, even remotely possible. So uh, a hand orthosis for stroke. And uh, you know, I don't think I need to, to convince this, this group just uh, how important, what a big deal stroke is. Uh, and you know, unfortunately it affects many, many people and uh, you know, the upper limb impairments are quite common and full recovery after the upper limb is after the upper limb is impaired is, is, is uncommon. Uh, perhaps what's a little bit less known is exactly what the impairment patterns look like. So the, uh, a very common impairment pattern after stroke affects the upper limb is this excessive spasticity and muscle tone where the, the, the flexors are, are, uh, are engaged permanently. The hand is kind of clenched in a fist. So Grasping object is not really a problem. Closing the fingers is not really a problem. It's the problem is that uh, many, many stroke survivors are unable to extend their fingers to release. And it's also a, a very painful condition. And this is what we set off to see if we can address with a, a wearable robotic device. And what I'm gonna do is kind of give you a quick overview of about five years worth of work that brought us to today. Uh, or more accurately about a year ago. And then from that point on, Ava and Jingxi will take over and they'll tell you about the things we're working on right now, the things that are very actively occupying us. So this is what we started with back five years ago with the idea to design a tendon-driven exoskeleton uh, to help the impaired hand after stroke. And uh, first we thought about what should be the tendon patterns, uh, what, which, which is very related to what impediment patterns do we want to assist. We knew from the beginning that if we want to make something that's fully wearable, it cannot have lots and lots of motors. So we'll have to very judiciously choose which hand degrees of freedom we want to assist with our uh, robotic orthosis. And uh, based on many discussions with clinicians, we settled on two possible configuration. The one that you see on the left has all the tendons on the dorsal side of the palm, and it's intended to assist hand extension, finger extension, uh, primarily intended for patients with excessive muscle tone in their flexors with excessive spasticity. So just uh, it, it allows, it assists the person in opening the fingers so that they can do a grasp, kind of a big object grasp. The second configuration, the one that you see on the right, we had tendons on the palmar side uh, assisting flexion of the MCP, but then the tendons were reversing nicely to the dorsal side of the finger to provide extension of the uh, interphalangeal joints. So that was really intended, you know, if you flex the MCP, you extend the IPs, so you assist in a pinch uh, of the pen. Uh, both driven by a single motor, both with a splint, a rigid splint that's stabilizing the wrist. Ultimately, after a lot of discussion, we just decided to focus exclusively on configuration one, this spasticity being by far the most common impairment pattern after stroke. We still believe configuration two for pinching has a lot of value, 
uh, but we just haven't focused on it as much. Once we decided on the tendon patterns, we started building our first iterations. You see that on the left, the very early design of our orthosis for assisting finger extension. We wanted to do intent inferral to detect when the person is trying to open their hand so that we can go ahead and provide assistance. And the first sensor that we tried was this off-the-shelf EMG armband at the time made by a company called Mayo, which unfortunately doesn't make them anymore. It's a very nice uh, off-the-shelf, low-cost device, beautifully integrated. It gives you eight uh, EMG sensors on the forearm. Uh, so we said, okay, then you know we're going to train an intent inferral method to detect when the person is trying to open the hand. And one of the first issues we ran into was that uh, if you train this intent inferral method with the person, you know, nicely resting that hand on the table without the device on, which you see uh, right here, right? You see how this is when they're trying to open the hand. You see how the signal shows that very clearly. Then they're relaxing. All the signals go down. Very easy to see these patterns. Once the orthosis is engaged and they're moving their arm and they're actively trying to grasp, all of that goes out the window. The, the, the signal patterns change dramatically. So uh, this is uh, what we refer to as, as, as concept drift. And Jingxi will talk a lot about it in a few minutes. So I don't want to go on for too long. At the time, the solution we found was just to increase lots and lots of training data. But uh, that's not ideal, as, uh, as Jingxi will talk about uh, in a little bit. Then once we had the intent inferral working well, we started looking at this tendon transmission mechanisms. And the problem is that the hand is very strong. And the human hand, I have so much appreciation for how an amazing mechanism the human hand is. And when it's spastic, it's just clenched into a fist and the tendons have to overcome spasticity and help extend the fingers. And you, know, you just route the tendon on the dorsal side of the finger, it just doesn't have enough moment arm. You need to have a huge motor, big forces, which is bad because it leads to distal migration. So that didn't really work. So then we said, okay, let's raise up the tendon a little bit. Let's have a, a bigger moment arm for our tendon. And this is kind of the first thing you try to build something like that. Uh, but then we quickly noticed that this doesn't really work either because the tendon likes to take these shortcuts, which reduce the moment arm around the IP joints, which is where we need it the most. Because oftentimes people tend to have more spasticity at the IP joints than the MCP. So this didn't work. It produced this claw-like hand postures, which are useless. So then what we did is we iterated through two more uh, transmission designs, both of them intended to increase the moment arm at the IP joints. Uh, and those were, were quite successful, especially what you see here as design pattern A, and you see on the bottom what it looks like on a, on a physical device. So now all of a sudden with a single uh, off the shelf motor, we had enough torque to assist uh, all four digits uh, in, in extension. And then we went back to the problem of intent inferral because we were really seeing that EMG, even with our uh, you know, training protocols was just not enough because you know, some patients, it's very hard for our classifier to detect EMG patterns. Even in some healthy people, it turns out the EMG patterns vary dramatically. Plus in, you know, in stroke patients, because of abnormal synergies in the brain, the EMG signals get further, further affected. So we added other sensing modalities. We added bend sensors on the fingers. We added a pressure sensor uh, inside the straps. You know, what would we do with that? So for example, some patients, not all, but some have a little bit of volitional finger movement left. When they try to open the hand, they cannot open fully, but the fingers will twitch, for example. So here you see, for example, the, the patient is trying to uh, open their hand and the finger twitches and we see the spike in our bend sensor, which we can use as a, as a signal to know to assist the hand. Similarly, when they're trying to close the hand, they're fighting the device. So the pressure on the pressure sensor goes up and we see this spike here, which we can use as a cue 
that hey we should be we should be closing the hand so you put all of those together and we did a study uh, with patients we did 15 training sessions uh, to try and assess the device for both rehabilita rehabilitative effects, but also as an assistive device. Uh, and this is a baseline, a very typical baseline, uh, a patient trying to, to grasp. You see that they cannot really open the fingers enough, uh, even for a, for a small object like this. A, a bigger cube, which I think the video is going to show in a, in a second, is essentially out of question. Uh, this is the same, let me move on here. Okay, so this is after 15 training sessions with the device, uh, we sometimes see a little bit of improvement, uh, especially for smaller objects, they, they're able to execute some grasps. Uh, it's not very strong. Uh, the bigger objects still uh, remain uh, impossible, out of, out of reach, the hand doesn't open enough. But there is, there are instances where we do see a rehabilitative effect of using the device. And then there's the uh, use of the device in an assistive fashion. You know, does it help while you're actually wearing it? Can you imagine uh, going through activities of daily life while wearing the device? And again, we saw some encouraging results there. You see that now with assistance from the device, opening the fingers, they can grasp, they can release. Uh, we can open the fingers enough even for, for grasping larger objects. So there were certainly you know, encouraging results in performance. We quantified this with things like you know, ARAT and, and, and box and blocks, various uh, tests. So uh, that's where we were, uh, I think, kind of circa you know, about a year and a half, two years ago, where we had this device, it was, it was working well in some cases, we can see uh, hints of both a rehabilitative effect and of assistive performance, but we were also learning a lot about you know, how it, it wasn't working and, 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 and coming short. And you can see here, for example, how we envision it being used you know, as a stabilization device so that with an impaired hand, you can stabilize an object so that with the unimpaired hand, the person can, can go ahead and do the task that they want to do. So, Hints of a lot of promise in rehabilitation and assistance, but still many, many shortcomings, which we then set off to address. And here I'll hand it over to Ava and Jingxi to talk about some of those. Uh, so Ava will go first and talk about our thumb actuation module. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Matei mentioned, sort of a, we have one thing that we found from the rehabilitation study was that Assisted grasping can really only go so far without assisting the thumb as well. Um, we found that in that study, maybe some patients could pick up the larger objects, but couldn't really pick up the smaller objects. Maybe they could pick up objects of all the sizes that we tried, but when we came time to transferring it over or doing something with the objects, then it didn't work so well. So one of our recent projects focuses on thumb actuation and thumbs have a lot of degrees of freedom. Even within the complicated system of the hand, they're already very complicated. So our approach, similar to many other research groups, narrows down the movement space to just thumb extension and abduction. So alternately radial deviation for the clinical folks in the audience. Um, as a way to assist reposition of the thumb, and this enables users to further open up the hand, which means that when we release the motors and allow them to completely close their hand, we get a bigger range of motion. That's intuitively sort of all good, right? So we do this with a tendon-based method. A linear actuator is directly attached to the thumb splint. So using the same outrigger system that we used for the fingers, and that helps the motor pull it outwards instead of just backwards. And then we use a passive fabric hammock going over that thumb splint routing around the palm, anchoring to the base of the hand on the owner side. And that happens to give a little extra support to the MP joint, a nice bonus. But the main benefit of the combined tendon network is that we get control over the opposition, reposition trajectory of the thumb without having to precisely align joint centers. And that's what we want. Next slide, Mente. But to get the question of does thumb actuation actually 
make a difference, we wanted to not just compare device performance against not wearing an exoskeleton at all, but also against using the same device where we keep the finger assistance, but we statically splint the thumb in general opposition. And that static configuration was the one that we used during um, the rehabilitation study two years ago. And so we accomplished static splinting in this case by just simply disconnecting the thumb actuator and otherwise leaving the tendon network intact. So we did this with five chronic hemorrhagic stroke subjects. We ran a number of unimanual bimanual tests with the different assisted conditions. And we were mainly interested in the idea of functional grasp stability. And so for us, that means holding an object then holding on to that object while doing something else that imposes sort of forces, maybe in this case, pulling on it against some resistance. And then in other tests, using that hand to stabilize a bottle, say, while untwisting the cap with the other hand. And we were interested in both force as an indication of a good grip, but also the duration of sustaining that force. So how long you could hold onto that object before it slipped up. And in these experiments, we actually found that the duration aspect is the main difference between thumb actuation and keeping the thumb splinted. And force magnitudes between the two conditions didn't really change, even when changing up the object sizes. And so we, we think the benefit here with the thumb, at least in this preliminary work, uh, comes from being able to reliably position the hand around the object in the best pose for that manipulation task. And static splinting could possibly still afford a strong grip in some places, but maybe needs more precision to get right, or then sort of puts your hand in an awkward position for the, for the next task. So conducting these manipulation tests, especially a, a set of the bimanual tests where we had the stroke patients twist caps off of bottles, um, this motivated another project where we looked at arm rotation. So that's pronation, supination of the arm. In particular, one of our subjects just had no ability to rotate his hand out of a pronated position. So his hand was always pointing down. He couldn't bring the thumb vertical. And that made the task with cups, bottles, things like that, really difficult to do with the weaker hand. And that was frustrating to do, especially when we put on this exoskeleton that sort of takes away a lot of the compensatory options that he would normally do, like curling up the wrist or like tucking into his armpit, things like that. So this motivated us to make another exoskeleton in this sort of orthosis ecosystem that enabled manual adjustment of forearm rotation but was lightweight and could be integrated into our existing hand orthosis. So I'll tell you about that in our one patient case study. So we accomplished this with a spiral cable mechanism. And this leverages the idea that when the arm rotates, the two bones in the forearm cross over each other. And so the arm behaves a lot like a beam in torsion where twisting gets distributed along the length of the arm. And so even though the proximal area of the forearm rotates a little bit, it can still be used as a reference spot to anchor a retracting cable. We do anchor the cable within a ratcheting spool mechanism at the proximal end of the forearm. And then we have the cable routed through a molded plastic brace, anchor the other end to the hand splint near the web of the thumb, that tendon root is the red spiral in the picture. We're particularly excited about this cable idea because most of the other ways of supporting supination involve an above elbow apparatus and you have to deal with accommodating the elbow joint or take up space on the dorsal side of the hand, which we're already using with our existing orthosis. So here we show basically us assisting forearm rotation with the orthosis. And in this case, most functional grasping tasks involve reaching for something that also involves a shoulder. So for this experiment, instead of the classic goniometer measurement to capture pure pronation, supination of just the forearm, we use an inclinometer measurement. So that's in this picture, a phone held in the hand. And we get an overall hand orientation and defector pose with no web assistance. And here we find that our device helps out a lot. Um, the far right image there indicates the range of angles recorded when we have 
that subject reach forward and try to maintain a thumb vertical position. Note that without the device at all, he just can't get his hand past sort of a downwards fully pronate position. So although we don't quite get to full vertical orientation, it's a noticeable difference. And our exoskeleton not only helps to supinate the arm, but also helps keep that arm in that upright position. That's why the range of angles on that far right with the exoskeleton engaged is sort of a thinner slice than the rest of them. We think the consistency benefit comes from the subject not needing to exert as much effort. And so he fatigues less quickly and has less plasticity. So with the device, the subject can open the hand, reach with the thumb in a near vertical orientation in order to grab the side of the bottle, grab it, and maintain that orientation. Note that he can't do that without the device. And what's really cool, maybe I'll just let the video play until we get to it. What's really cool is that he can engage the flexor muscles at the elbow and the shoulder. This would normally trigger all the spasticity that would sort of make the holding a hand vertical in order to get that drinking position really difficult. But he's able to do that and get a full drinking motion uh, with the device. And so we're really excited about it. Um, and now I'll hand it off to, to Jingqi to talk about our semi-supervised learning work as well. Hello, everyone. So I'll be discussing the semi-supervised learning algorithm that we have been actively working on for the past few months. Um, so as Mate mentioned before, um, a key challenge in intern inferral using machine learning is the concept drift. So concept drift describes the changes in the input signal uh, to our system. And it mainly has two classes. The first one is intra-session drift, which happens uh, inside uh, the same session and is caused by, for example, fatigue, device migration, um, new arm positions, et cetera. And the second one is intercession drift, um, which is primarily caused by donning and doffing the device. So the below image uh, visualizes a data set collected from one of our subject, and the data set is collected under uh, three different uh, arm conditions labeled on top of the image. And, and as you can see, um, these underlying distribution of the input signal changes drastically as um, the patient, as the subject, actively change their arm positions um, as they rest their arm on the table and then they uh, raise their arm over the table. Uh, and also it changes when the patient starts interacting their hand with uh, the device. So in this work, we focus primarily on intercession drift. So this is another example of extreme example of device migration that may cause uh, intercession, intercession drifts. You can see the, the thing comes off. This is a rare example, which doesn't happen, uh, but it's, it's a, a more frequent example is the tiny and subtle migration as the subject start using the device. Um, so uh, the classic way of handling intercession drift is to incorporate incorporate as much uh, signal variation as possible. Um, however, this is bad because um, this plays a substantial burden on the user, um, as you can imagine. If So in this work, uh, we're trying to um, adapt intercession drift using unlabeled data. This is good because uh, we can just train, collect a small data set and then um, as the user starts using the device, the, the device, the classifier can adapt themselves um, to the intercession drift by utilizing the unlabeled data. So on a high level, um, we have an ensemble of LDA learners. And ensemble methods have uh, been proved in multiple papers uh, in the machine learning community to be very robust to noise and uncertainty. And because we have um, these multimodal sensing suites, our expectation is that um, when the concept trick happens, some classifiers with a certain subset of the sensing modalities will be will remain robust, and we can use these confident uh, classifiers to help update those unconfident classifiers. So to be more specific, we have a this um, sorry go back. Yeah. 
So to be more specific, we have a discriminant based uh, Oracle. So when a new unlabeled data arrives, um, if all the confident learners agree on the label uh, of this new unlabeled data, we will add this data sample um, along with the prediction to the data buffer of those unconfident learners. And later on, we will use this data buffer to update those unconfident learners. Yeah. Um, to evaluate our algorithm, we first run offline analysis on uh, five subjects. So we collect uh, a data set um, with partial data. So it's only on one of the ARM conditions. And we also collect data set, a complete data set that is uh, collected from different ARM conditions. And our results show that some supervised learning, even though trained on partial data, is able to outperform a supervised learning trained on the complete data. So we go ahead and then do online analysis on two subjects using a pick and handover functional task. And both subjects is able to complete seven times of the task in uh, one minute. Um, so this is subject four performing the functional um, pick and um, handover task. We also, um, we also develop a um, emergency control button to override the control of the classifier in case of emergency. So next one. Um, Right, so this is uh, for another subject. Uh, and for this subject, we noticed that there is a bunch of start and stops uh, motion of the, uh, of the device, but then this is later on uh, gone, uh, possibly due to the semi-supervised updates. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Jingxi, thank you, Ava. This is the kind of the, the updates, the most recent updates we wanted to tell everyone about. So now just to, to wrap it up, I'm going to move very fast here because I don't want to you know, uh, delay the, the proceedings too much. Some of the lessons that we've learned, the one thing I want to highlight here is just how difficult spasticity is. Human hand is very strong. Spasticity is hard to overcome. And just the interplay between spasticity and activity is very poorly understood. Every clinician that we've spoken to you know, knows that yes, spasticity increases with activity, but how you know, quantify that, that's very little, there's very little understanding of that and it'll turn out to be quite important in, in the long term for something like this. And then the, the other lessons that I mentioned is, first of all, just the, the, one of the main difficulties for us, and I think for other devices as well, is that once you put a wearable rehabilitative device or assistive device on a person, oftentimes the device itself takes away the compensatory strategies that people have developed over many years of living with that condition. So our orthosis, for example, is, is somewhat bulky and it prevents some of the ways that they've learned to just squeeze things between the fingers. And I think this is a general thing, right? This compensatory strategies, ideally we like to get people to stop using the compensatory strategies and restart doing the task the way, you know, uh, healthy, healthy subjects, able-bodied people do it. But once you take away the compensatory strategies, you immediately reduce their functionality. So your device better provide a lot of value to get out of that valley that you've created. So that's, that's very, very hard. Uh, and then finally, you know, the, the big question, which is, can we build a device for the hand that is both assistive and rehabilitative? If we had to focus on just one, which one should we go for? What are the, 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 the trade-offs that we're making there? And that's a question that we're still very much trying to answer every day. Thank you for your attention.